All right, now in this lecture, we're going to get into the details of Moore's circle. We have our equations that we had from last time for sigma x prime and sigma y prime and tau x prime y prime. And the way to think of this is you can think of a, a rectangle, and, and it's, um, I have it drawn here with the sigma x, sigma y, and tau x y. and we're going to rotate through some given angle theta. Now a positive direction for theta is from the x to the y axis. And so with this rotation of this square, I have a new stress block or stress element that's located in the x prime, y prime coordinate system, and it has new components, sigma x prime, sigma y prime, and tau x prime, y prime. Another way to think of it is with a wedge. This is often done in mechanics materials so that we can illustrate the concept of equilibrium to relate these equations to one another, where this wedge has that top angle of theta as shown here. It corresponds to the same angle theta that I have in my first picture. And on the inclined plane of the wedge, I have the stress components, the normal stress, sigma n, and the component tau nt. So what we're going to do is we're going to work with these equations a little bit. We're going to manipulate them in terms of the sine theta, excuse me, the sine 2 theta and the cosine 2 theta terms and see how we can get a circle out of this. And for stress, this is known as Moore's circle of stress. This will be valid for plane stress transformations as well as plane strain transformations, plane moment of inertia transformations. The third component in the z direction, the third normal stress, sigma z, will be the same as sigma z prime. It deals with the same transformations that we had previously. Now, if you're an undergraduate student, I would direct you to my undergraduate class in mechanics materials that I have online as well, that you can see um, all the details from that perspective. This particular perspective I'm taking in this lecture is with the background of already knowing what Stre uh, stress transformations are from the tensor perspective and how that may relate back to what you already know about Moore's circle. All right, so with this starting point here, I'm going to do a little bit of manipulation with the equations. Uh, one of the things I'll do is I'll label this term right here sigma average, and I'm going to move that to the left-hand side next to sigma n, which is the same as sigma x prime. Then I have this equation for tau nt, and it's going to be written in a similar form, just the same form that I have here. So let me get another clean page, and uh, we'll make that notation. Okay, so I have these equations here, and I do want to point out that sigma average is the average of the two n-plane normal stresses, sigma x and sigma y. Well, let's square both sides of this equation and add them together. So I'm going to have a term that looks like sigma n minus sigma average, quantity squared, plus tau nt minus 0, quantity squared. And there's a reason why I have that 0 in there. I'm going to use that to emphasize another point later. But on the right-hand side, I'm going to uh, square both of these terms and add them together. So I'm going to have a term that looks like sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared cosine squared 2 theta. I'm going to have a term that looks like tau xy squared sine squared 2 theta. And then I'm going to have a mixed term. This one's going to be positive. It's going to be a sigma x minus a sigma y over 2 cosine 2 theta plus a tau xy uh, times a tau xy sine 2 theta. And there's actually going to be two of them. All right. So when I expand that square out, I'll have two of those type terms. I'll do the same thing and I'll expand out by a square on the second equation. I'm, like I said, I'm squaring them and adding them together. So the first term, the negative signs work together to be a positive. So I'll have a term that looks like sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared. Now I've got a sine squared 2 theta. 
and I'm going to have a term that looks like tau xy squared and it's going to be a cosine squared 2 theta. Let me make that look a little better. And then I'm going to have two mixed terms, but now there's a negative sign, so it's going to be a minus 2 sigma x minus sigma y over 2 sine 2 theta times a tau xy cosine 2 theta. And if we look at this really closely, the last two terms, this one uh, needs a different color to highlight it, this term and this term, after all that multiplication, annihilate each other. And we have some terms that look kind of similar to each other. We can factor them out. And we have a term that has out in front of it a sigma x minus sigma y over 2, quantity squared. And then we have a cosine squared 2 theta plus a sine squared 2 theta. And then we have a term that looks like tau xy squared with a sine squared 2 theta and a cosine squared 2 theta. Now by our trig identities, this term and this term both equal to 1. And what we have on the right hand side is sigma x minus sigma y over 2, that quantity squared, plus tau xy, that quantity squared. And that is, um, if we look at that, that is independent of theta. That is completely independent of theta. Um, for any coordinate system that we start off with, any x and y coordinate system that we start off with, that is going to be a constant. Now for reasons it will make a lot more sense when I talk about this being a circle, I'm going to call that r squared. And that's equal to sigma n minus sigma average quantity squared plus tau nt minus zero quantity squared. All right, let's focus on that last equation just a little bit more. I'm going to write down the equation of a circle that is not centered at the origin. Typically, we would write in algebra something like x minus x sub c squared plus y minus y sub c squared is equal to little r squared. The center of the circle is given by these two values. And in our case, the center of the circle is not at x sub c, y sub c. But for our case, it's going to be sigma average comma 0. So typically, we would have an x and y axis. Um, let me see, I can use this tool to draw a circle, I think. That is the center. Maybe we have a circle that's located at x sub c, y sub c. But in our case, instead of x and y axes, we're going to use sigma and tau axes. You see the sigma takes the same uh, position as the x, and the tau takes the same position as the y. The center of the circle is going to be located on the sigma axis, but it's not going to be up and down on the tau axis, because that second coordinate is 0 all the time. Now here's one little thing that's a little bit weird about Mohr circle. Um, I'm going to make this notation that a positive tau is directed downward. Now there's going to be a good reason for that, and we'll see that soon. But positive tau is going to be directed downward. So in general, the coordinate of the circle is going to be on this axis. Let's see if I can draw the circle again. Center is going to be maybe here, and it could be something. Uh, like that.
Now, the average value of the stress may be positive or it may be negative, so the center could be to the right of the origin, it could be to the left of the origin, or it could be right at the origin in special circumstances. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through a, a way to determine, uh, to, to sketch more circle and how to use that to find values for a in-plane stress transformation. And then I'll go back and I'll show from our original tensor equations how we end up with the same thing. And we can even uh, solve an eigenvalue problem in order to get the directions of the stress. All right. So um, this has the equation of the circle capital R uh, for the radius. All right. Let me uh, make a clean page, and we'll go through the process of setting up more circle. Uh, Maybe we'll keep this equation handy for us to take a look at. Uh, maybe I'll write it down again, and we'll see how all this works. All right. So we're starting off with a state of plane stress, sigma x, sigma y, and tau xy. It could be a state of generalized plane stress in which we has a, have a sigma z. The in-plane transformations don't affect sigma z. So I can either have it on there or not. Um, and again, the positive direction of theta is from the x-axis to the y-axis. To emphasize that, I'll just draw these little axes in here in this block. And I've drawn all of our stress components in what I would call the positive directions. So we use the number subscripts a lot for our stresses. So sigma 1, 1 would be the same as sigma x, uh, sigma x or sometimes people call it sigma xx. Sigma y would be the same as sigma 2, 2 or sigma yy, and a positive tau xy points on the positive x face and in the positive y direction. So it's acting on this positive x face, it's pointing in the positive y direction. Uh, tau xy, some people would call that sigma 1, 2, some people call it sigma xy, all of those things indicate a shearing stress, tau xy, but positive direction state of stress is where the one on the right side of that block in the positive x face points in the positive y direction. All right, so here's what we need to do for more circle. We need to plot three points. We need to plot what's called the x point, which is going to be sigma x comma tau xy. We need to plot the y point, which is sigma y comma minus tau xy. And we need to plot the center of the circle, which is located at sigma average, comma zero. So let me get my axes set up. Let's see if I can draw that a little straighter, a little more horizontal. I calculate, and we'll do this with numbers pretty soon, but I want to show this in symbols first. We'll calculate sigma average, and let's just say it's over here. Now remember, our axes are such that positive tau is directed downward. So when I plot the point sigma x comma tau xy, if tau xy is positive, it would point down here somewhere. make this a little bit bigger. I don't want it to look like it's landing exactly on the axis. In general, it will not lie right on that axis. But my x point will be this point right here, which is sigma x comma tau xy. The y point that I'm going to label this way is 180 degrees apart from that, and this is going to be the point sigma y comma minus tau xy. Now I've drawn this as if sigma y is on the compressive side of the axis. It can be on the positive side, it can be wherever it lands, but they'll always be an equal distance away from the x point to the origin and the y point to the origin of the circle, the center of the circle. The x point to the center of the circle and the y point to the center of the circle will be the same. I didn't mean to say the origin there. All right, now this particular uh, line segment actually represents a diameter of more circle.
Okay, so we're going to draw our circle. Now there are some important points on this circle. Let's see if I can make this a little more circle-ish. That looks a little better. On this, and these are the extreme. This point right here has a coordinate. We're going to call that a special coordinate, sigma p1. For Those are their principles, and they exist a lot. The horizontal diameter or circle represents a rotation in the xy plane. The components have to vary in a fixed way. You can have a stress state. The stress components have to bring to those And up here on the negative side of this axis is sigma average comma minus tau maximum. on the circle. that in That's going to be the angle 2 theta p. Now how do I find that angle? Well, let me use a different color. If I were to drop a vertical line down here, I can construct a right triangle whose height is equal in magnitude to whatever the value is that I have for tau xy. And this leg of this triangle is going to be the distance from the origin to this point, which is sigma x minus sigma average. And let's look at this sigma x minus sigma, sigma average in a little bit more detail. That's sigma x minus sigma x plus sigma y divided by 2. All right, so I have a sigma x and I have a minus sigma x over 2. That works out to be a uh, sigma x over 2. And then I have a minus sigma y over 2. So sigma x minus sigma average is the same as sigma x minus sigma y divided by 2. Now it's not important that you know those equations in my opinion. I just want you to see where that comes from. But the other important thing is, is you notice this term right here is the same as the one that we have up here, but it's squared. And so this R term right here follows the rule of that right triangle that R squared is equal to this leg squared, which is what we just saw, sigma x minus sigma y over 2 quantity squared, plus the other leg squared, follows the Pythagorean theorem. Okay. So if you do this with a piece of graph paper, or even if you do it as a semi-graphical method where you have numbers on these points, we do not have to know any weird transformation equations. We can figure all this stuff out that we need just by the use of the Pythagorean theorem 
And we're also going to use the definition of a tangent. But we can find that pretty quickly from this as uh, the tangent of 2 theta p is going to be tau xy divided by this leg sigma x minus sigma y over 2. All right. There are two ways to use more circle. One is to um, a common way is to find principal stresses. Another way is to use a general transformation. We're going to use the case to find uh, principal stresses. Okay, we're going to use that as an example. And I may go back in and uh, backfill with an example of a general plane stress transformation. But let's take a look at this. If I want the maximum principal stress, sigma P1, I start at the origin and I go first to the center of the circle and I add a radius term. If I want the second principal stress, I would go from the origin, I'd go over to the right, sigma average, and then I would take away a radius of the circle. And if I want my maximum in-plane shear stress, then that would be equal to the radius of the circle. So these are some important things to be able to identify on our Mohr circle. Well, let's do a problem where we have some numbers. All right. So let's find our principal stresses in the directions using Mohr circle. All right, so I started out saying we need to find three points. Sigma x comma tau xy, so in this case it's 100 comma 40. Our y point is going to be uh, minus 80 comma minus 40. And the center of our circle is the average of the two normal stresses, sigma x and sigma y, comma 0. So 100 minus 80 is 20. 20 divided by 2 is 10. So the center of our circle is going to be at 10, comma, 0. Okay, so maybe this is my sigma. Remember, positive tau is down. And maybe the center of the circle is right here, 10, comma, 0. All right, I am going to use my handy tool to draw a circle. Maybe it's about like that. And my x point is going to be 100 units over, and it's going to be about 40 units down. So maybe this is about where my x point is going to land. And my y point is going to be 180 degrees from that. See if I can get this. Maybe it's going to land about here. And I'm labeling those. This is important to know which one is which. We'll see in a moment. So this uh, location is 100 comma 40. This location is minus 80 comma minus 40. All right, so. Let's drop a vertical line down to this point. And we're going to have a triangle who has a height of 40. And a triangle who has this leg of, well, I guess this is going to be 90. All right? From the origin, we go over to the x point 100. But we're starting at position 10. So that length would be 90. The angle from this to the principal directions, I call 2 theta p. Okay, because remember, uh, the circle is written in terms of two thetas, sine and cosine of two theta. All right, so the radius squared is going to be 90 squared plus 40 squared. We'll get a number for that in a moment. And the tangent 
2 theta p is going to be equal to 40 over 90. All right, and with those numbers, I got a radius of 98.5, uh, rounding up to 370 digits. And the angle 2 theta p with the inverse tangent of 40 over 90 is 24 degrees, and theta p then is 12 degrees. So let's talk about what this answer means. So if I take my square and I rotate it a positive 12 degrees. Now, here's the deal. Here's the entire reason why we put positive tau downward. is So that the direction of rotation on this circle would be the same as in the material. So think of this diameter, this blue diameter, moving and rotating to the principal stress diameter, which is represented by the horizontal line, which I'm going to put in red in this picture. Okay, so the direction is positive 12 degrees. So if I start off with my original stress state like this, uh, let me make that a blue color. To emphasize the same color, my original picture. I go this way, theta p, which is 12 degrees, and I will get to my red diameter stress state. We can call that the x prime and the y prime directions if we want, where the x stress went to this position, who has value sigma p1 comma 0, has normal stress sigma p1, and the y stress went to this position, which is at the sigma p2 comma 0 location. If the y point was here on the right side instead of the x point, then the y point would have gone and turned into sigma p1. In this case, that's the case uh, that we have here. But sigma p1 that we know that we saw before is equal to 10 plus the radius, that's the average plus the radius, so 10 plus 98.5, I guess it's going to be 108.5, and sigma p2 is going to be equal to 10 minus 98.5, and that's going to be equal to, what, minus 88.5 units. The maximum in-plane shearing stress It's the radius of the circle, 98.5. Uh, and I guess in this case, we're looking at megapascals for all these terms. The direction of sigma p1 is at 12 degrees from the original x-axis. OK, so this is how we can use more circle. Let's take these same numbers for this plane stress state. Let's do an example where we work this as an eigenvalue problem and see if we get the same result. We should, but let's see how we have to interpret the results to get the same thing. So let's keep this in mind, and let's uh, start over with a fresh page. All right, so what I've done is I've written these stress components for the plain stress state in the stress tensor format. 3 by 3 matrix of components. And what we're going to do is we're going to solve the eigenvalue problem that looks like sigma minus lambda i is equal to 0 tensor. We'll call this page up and we'll look at our values. Uh, but uh, let me scoot this up so I have a, a, a even more room to do this work. All right, so when I take sigma minus lambda i, now remember uh, what lambda times i, that's the identity tensor, looks like. It's where we have, instead of 1's on the diagonal, lambda times i would be lambda's on the diagonal. And so sigma minus lambda i would be looking like uh, this. minus 80 minus lambda, 
and actually that's uh, sigma y was equal to minus 80, so let me fix this. This should have been 100 here, and this should have been minus 80 here. One hundred minus lambda forty zero forty minus eighty minus lambda zero and zero 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 and that needs to be equal to the zero tensor. Now we can develop our characteristic equation by the determinant. The determinant of the zero tensor is going to be zero, and the determinant of what I have on the left, well we can figure that out. This effectively reduces down to a two by two matrix. In situations where we have generalized plane stress, we can we can reduce this problem down to an in-plane transformation, a two by two matrix. The full three by three matrix is a good job for MATLAB or some other computer program. I won't expect you to do that by hand, but I will expect you to do a two by two type matrix. So let me rewrite this one more time as a 2 by 2 uh, matrix. That'll just make the algebra easier. The concepts are going to be the same. Now calculating a, uh, the determinant of a 2 by 2 matrix is very easy. What we're going to do is take these two diagonal terms, multiply them together, so 100 minus lambda, and we're going to have minus 80 minus lambda. And then we're going to take these two diagonal terms and subtract them away. So it's going to be a minus of 40 times 40. And then I said the determinant has to be equal to 0 because on the right-hand side we have the 0 tensor. So I'm going to do a little bit of uh, math here. So we're going to have what uh, minus 100 times 80 we're going to have a plus 80 lambda. We're going to have a minus 100 lambda. We're going to have a plus lambda squared. And then we're going to have a minus 40 squared is equal to 0. Now we're going to use the quadratic formula. We're going to have a lambda squared. Uh, let me do my math. I'm going to have a, looks like a minus 20 lambda. And then, uh, I don't know if this is going to be positive or negative yet. Well, I guess it's going to be negative. But let's see what we have. We've got uh, 100 times 80. And then we have 40 squared. It's going to be a minus 9,600. And this is a really good use for the quadratic formula. So remember how that works. Uh, let's do it in general, lambda 1 and 2. The two roots are going to be negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. All right, so my b term is minus 20, so the, uh, the negative of that is 20 plus or minus the square root of b squared, 20 squared, minus 4 a c all over 2 a. It's going to be 10 plus or minus square root of, uh, let's see here, 20 squared. Now, I have a minus 4 times 1 times minus 9,600. That will make sure that uh, I have a positive under the square root. If you don't get a positive under the square root, uh, you're in trouble. There's an algebra mistake somewhere. So 4 times 9,600. I'm going to add that to 400. I got uh, 38,800. Take the square root of that. Uh, and it needs to be divided by uh, 2 after I take the square root. So this is going to be 10 plus or minus uh, 
98.5. Now from our previous example, you may notice that the 10 represents our in-plane sigma average. And this term is representing our r. So it's our sigma average plus and minus r value. So our first principal stress is going to be 108.5. And our second principal stress is going to be 88.5 uh, compression. So we do get the same answers for the principal stresses. Well, what about the eigenvector? Okay. In this particular problem, sigma z, or the third principal stress, is going to be sigma z. It's going to be equal to 0 in this case. If this were a non-zero value right here, that would equal to the same thing that we have right here. Okay, so it's always the same value for a case of generalized plane stress. All right, let's check out that direction. So now we need, need to do a little bit of work. We need to find the eigenvectors associated with each eigenvalue. And we have to interpret them to see if we get the same things that we got with our Moore circle analysis. All right, so I made a little bit of room. Now. When we do the eigenvalue problem to find the uh, eigenvectors, we're looking at the equation that looks something like this. Um, let me write it in a slightly different way. We want the directions in which sigma times some unit normal vector is equal to some scalar times that unit normal vector. And that's how we develop this equation. Sigma times n minus lambda i times n equal to the zero tensor. And sigma minus lambda i n equal to the zero tensor. And we have two ways that we could make this true. Either the little n vector is 0, but it can't be. It has to be a unit vector. Or sigma minus lambda i is equal to 0 tensor. So that's what we started with when we did the eigenvalue uh, determination. Sigma minus lambda i is equal to 0 tensor. Now we want to find the associated directions in which this occurs. So we're going to start by choosing one of our eigenvalues say lambda 1, and we're going to put in uh, our values for our stress tensor, and we're going to subtract off that lambda 1 term on the diagonal. So it's going to be 100 minus 108.5, 40, 0, and it's going to be 40 and now minus 80 minus 108.5, 0, 0, 0, 0. We can reduce the order of this as well. Let me move this 0 over here so it's clear. We can reduce the order of this as well to a 2D. And we have some value of the unit vector n1 and n2 for which this is equal to uh, the 0 vector. Okay, so this is the zero vector in this case. We are subject to the constraint that, in general, n1 squared plus n2 squared plus n3 squared is equal to 1. It's going to be a unit normal. Now, in this particular case, n3 is equal to 0. in the two-dimensional or generalized plane stress case. 
So we really only need to find n1 and n2. All right. Let me pause and clean this up a little bit. All right. So I'm going to take this column, n1 and n2, and multiply it by the first row. So I'm going to have 100 minus 108.5. That's going to be minus 8.5 n1 plus 40 n2 is equal to 0. Now what this does is this gives me a relationship between n1 and n2. So n1 is going to be equal to 40 over 8.5 n2. And the direction is can be scaled arbitrarily. We're going to scale it to be a unit vector in a moment. But for right now, we're going to take n2 is equal to 1. And in that case, I am going to get then n1 is equal to, let me calculate this number, 40 divided by 8.5, 4.705, So I have a vector that has components, 4.706, 1,0. Now that is not a unit vector, but I want to make it a unit vector. I need to divide it by its magnitude. I'm going to take this 4.706, divided by its magnitude, which can be found by taking the square root of the sum of its uh, terms, 4.706 squared plus 1 squared. And let's see what I get for a unit vector component. 4.706 squared, I'm going to take it, uh, multiply by 1. That magnitude is 4.811. 4.706 divided by 4.811. is 0 0.9802 and 1 divided by 4.811 is 0 0.2079. So this is the eigen vector associated with our eigenvalue of 108.5 megapascals. All right. Well, let's see if I did all my math right. This should be a unit vector that points in a direction that is 12 degrees off of the x-axis. Let's make a little room. The physical interpretation of this direction is if we start with our x-axis, I move over 0.9802 units, and I go up to uh, 0.2079 units. All right. If I did my math right, that angle I should be able to figure out by the tangent of theta should be 0 0.2079 divided by 0 0.9802. I do the division, and I do the inverse tangent, and what do you know? I got 11.9749. We've got a little bit of rounding going on. Um, we get 12 degrees. Okay, so this mass matches our Mohr circle. When we do this process, we can also get the other eigenvalue. We know that eigenvalues are perpendicular to each other. The other eigenvalue should point off in this direction. 
it should be a right angle right here, it should have components that go up 0.9802 and it goes over this way uh, 0.2079. So you can compute that direction as well. There are always three eigenvalues. The third one is going to be pointing straight out of the page at us and it is going to be 001. So I'll let you do the math, but the second eigenvector should look like uh, either this or it's negative. And the third, zero, zero, 001. Now one thing about eigenvectors, and something you should always check, is that eigenvectors should be mutually perpendicular to each other. So if we notice, if we take the dot product of our first eigenvector with the second, we get zero. If we take the third eigenvector and dot it with either the first or the second, we get zero. That's a check for perpendicularity. All right, so I hope you uh, got to see an example now of Moore circle. I have literally worked hundreds of maybe thousands of more circle problems over the years. I have another uh, channel on my YouTube channel where I do undergraduate mechanics materials and there are a bunch of examples worked out through that as well. So if you want to see more examples of more circle I refer you to that. But I did want to show this in the context of something that you may have already been familiar with to the more uh, maybe the newer subject of solving the eigenvalue problem of the stress tensor to find the principal stress values and directions. Now this will pretty much wrap up our discussion of stress. I may drop in another example or two later. The next thing we'll get to then in our elasticity class are the equations of elasticity. We've talked about strain and we've talked about stress. What we want to do then is we want to see how stress and strain can be related and specifically for conditions of elasticity.